All right, welcome back to our BCBA task list series where we're continuing concepts and principles. Today we're covering stimulus control. Stimulus control is a pretty dense topic. It combines a lot of other different concepts that we'll talk about at other times in the task list, such as stimulus generalization, stimulus discrimination, prompt fading, these kind of things. So what we're going to focus on in B10 is really just the essence of stimulus control, what it is, faulty stimulus control, and the things that might interfere with stimulus control. So much more technical of a concept. So hang in there. All right. Do your best. Remember, we're not perfect the first time we're learning something. So take it in. If you have to come back to it, that's totally fine. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. That being said, always check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. Like and subscribe for all of our updates. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. So stimulus control. At the essence, it is behavior that occurs in the presence of an SD more often than in the absence. That's under stimulus control. In other words, if we have a green light, I'm going to drive my car. If we have a red light, I'm going to stop my car. Me driving my car is under the influence of stimulus control of the green light. Me stopping my car is under the stimulus control of the red light. The crux of it, that's the essence of it. No more complex than that on the surface. Now, stimulus control occurs when the latency, duration, or magnitude, some so, so some sort of measurable piece or dimension of the behavior changes, of the response. It's altered in the presence of an antecedent. Responses produce more reinforcement in the presence of a stimulus than in, in its absence. And that's how we really create stimulus control, all right? If we have antecedent one and antecedent two, and I respond, 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 and I'm getting reinforced, 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 and then antecedent two, respond, 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 and nothing, 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 well, my behavior is going to occur much more often under A1. It's going to become a discriminative stimuli. This is how we create discriminative stimuli. When a response occurs in the presence of an antecedent stimulus, we reinforce it. You do that enough, that antecedent stimulus becomes an SD for reinforcement, and the cycle continues. So question, stimulus control is often referred to as blank in practice. Now, you'll hear this term all the time, instructional control, right? We're trying to gain instructional control. We have good instructional control over the behavior. That RBT is really good at establishing instructional control. All that means is in the presence of the technician or you or whoever it is, the behavior is changing. Either the latency, the duration, the magnitude of these responses are changing in the presence of that person. That's why you often hear stimulus control referred to as instructional control in practice. It isn't consequence control where we're talking about antecedents here, and it is not prompt control. So stimulus control is often referred to as instructional control in practice. So continuing, factors affecting the development of stimulus control. Remember, to get stimulus control, what do we need to do? Well, we need to reinforce in the presence of an antecedent more than the other, right? We need reinforcement, reinforcement, okay? So that's how we're going to create our SD. And a behavior is under stimulus control when it occurs more, or the latency changes, the duration changes, or the magnitude changes in the presence of that antecedent. What can affect that? Well, one, pre-attending skills. If we're dealing especially with early learners, maybe learners with developmental disabilities, um, intellectual disabilities, Pre-attending skills are sometimes a challenge because in order to gain control, you've got to be able to orient behaviors to the proper SD. If that SD is, is not in the, the, the view of the learner or they're not aware of that SD, it's going to be difficult for that SD to, to gain control of the behavior we want to see. Stimulus salience. salience. So it's the prominence of the stimulus in the learning environment. Now, if we have a green light or a stop sign, those things are very salient in our environment. They're, they're quickly gaining control over our behavior. When you act differently in front of your parents compared to your friends, well, those parents and friends are very prominent in your learn in the in the learner's environment. If you're trying to get control of a behavior 
under the stimulus of, let's say, a, a very small detail in a book or a very small detail of your instruction, that's going to be a lot more difficult because it's just not very prominent in the learner's environment. So the more prominent you can make your SD or your stimulus, the more likely you'll be able to create stimulus control. Now, what about overselective stimulus control? Well, the range of features of SDs is limited. So especially for children with autism and intellectual disabilities, if I say I have a car, right, my drawing of a car, what they'll focus on is maybe one minor aspect, right? Maybe they'll focus on just the lights, just the tires. They don't always focus on the whole picture. So the range of features on what we can create as SDs can tend to be limited. So when we have a limited field of stimuli that we can create SDs, that's said to be over-selective. Now, stimulus blocking, masking, and overshadowing are very often confused. They're misunderstood. Think of masking in terms of something else in the environment is preventing the correct behavior from happening, even though the correct behavior can be evoked under the right SD. The best, most common example is a student who can answer questions. So when they're asked a question, they're able to answer the questions, refuses to answer the question in front of his friends. And why? Well, because this stimuli, the friends, mask the ability of the student to answer the question. That's why it's called masking, because the competing stimuli is blocking the student from engaging in the response, and so it's blocking the SD from controlling the behavior. And then overshadowing, this is when we're teaching something, so a more salient, so a more prominent aspect of a stimulus arrangement interferes with the acquisition of a stimulus control. If I'm, I'm teaching, let's say, shapes, okay, and I have a triangle, but it's a blue triangle, if the blue overshadows triangle, then what might end up happening is when you say point to triangle, the learner might just start pointing to blue everything, blue circles, blue squiggles. The blue is more prominent, more salient, and has interfered with the SD of triangle. So you can see how these are more technical. They take a little time. So you're going to have to put some work into understanding these factors at a very deep level, especially masking when we're dealing with older kids in social situations, and then overshadowing when we're dealing with kids maybe with autism or, or intellectual disabilities where it's going to be a lot more important that we are aware of the salience of the stimuli we're teaching. So continuing, faulty stimulus control right, occurs when a behavior is under control of an irrelevant antecedent stimulus. And this is part of the reasons when we're teaching generalization that we, we train loosely, we train common stimuli, because we're trying to, multiple exemplars, we're trying to get behavior to avoid being under the control of some irrelevant stimulus. So some examples from Vargas, uh, pictures or diagrams are used instead of text to complete an exercise. So if we're teaching sight words, for example, pictures are used instead. A common one is highlighting or physical layout gives away answers. So what we're really talking about here a lot of times is prompts, right? Um, in, uh, inadvertent prompts, prompts that aren't meant to be, they're 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 taking control of the behavior. When we what we really need is the actual actual SD, usually the natural SD, to take control of the behavior. So students are able to answer questions without reading a passage. Maybe the questions are too easy. If all problems on a page require the same solution, well, there's no need to discriminate between solutions. And then can questions be answered based on cues alone? So what we're really talking about with faulty stimulus control a lot of times is poor prompting inadvertent prompting, or sometimes just poor planning on our part where we're teaching the same thing over and over again, maybe too many times. And what ends up happening is the behavior comes under control of a stimulus that we didn't even realize was there. So be very, very cautious and aware of, am I really putting this behavior under the stimulus, under the control of a stimulus I want, or is it under control of, let's say, a prompt? So how might one work to put behavior under the control of the correct antecedent stimulus? 
if we've got faulty stimulus control, what should we do? Well, extinction alone isn't going to work because remember, stimulus control, we have antecedent, antecedent, one, two. To create stimulus control, you've got to reinforce, right, in the presence of the stimulus you want. Now, you can put this one on extinction, but if we don't create a new stimulus, we're not going to create a new antecedent stimulus. So extinction alone is not enough. Reinforcing the behavior in the presence of both stimuli is going to compete, right? If we go here and we start reinforcing here as well, well, now we've just got competing stimuli. So what we're going to do is a stimulus transfer control procedure, which we will talk more about, where we're fading control of a stimulus to another stimulus. So an SD evokes behavior because its presence is correlated with differential availability of reinforcement. Quick recap, right? An SD evokes behavior because its presence is correlated with differential availability of reinforcement. Again, let's look at it one more time, right? Antecedent one, antecedent two. This is our SD. Why? Because in its presence, we're getting reinforcement. In its absence, our S delta, right? Our S delta, we aren't. The differential availability of reinforcement has led to antecedent one becoming an SD. Responses in the presence of the SD produce reinforcement, while responses in the absence of the SD do not. Now, that's a little misleading because it is possible for reinforcement to take place in both conditions. Reinforcement can happen here, then nothing, nothing, reinforcement. However, in antecedent one, we're still getting reinforcement 75% of the time, where in two, only 25. So reinforcement can still occur in both situations. Reinforcement is just taking more in the presence of the actual SD that we want to see have control. So a rat hits a switch when it hears a buzzer and is not when the buzzer does not sound. The buzzer functions as a what? So when the rat hears a buzzer, what does it do? It responds. When no buzzer, rat does not respond. So the buzzer is an SD. It's evoking the behavior of hitting the switch because it's likely that in the past, in the presence of the buzzer, hitting the switch led to reinforcement. The S delta says there is no reinforcement available for hitting the switch when the buzzer is not sounding. Developing stimulus control. So developing stimulus control, we are reinforcing responses in the presence of an SD and not in the presence of the S delta. Essentially, we're teaching stimulus discrimination training, right? Touch square and circle, right? If I say touch square, I need you to touch square, and only when you touch square am I reinforcing. So when I say touch square, right, that's going to become our SD for touching square, which will lead to our reinforcement. Circle will be our S delta. That's how we develop stimulus control. Matching to sample procedures, kind of what we're doing here, very, very commonly known as stimulus discrimination or developing stimulus control. Now, concept formation is defined by a set of shared features found in the examples of each concept. So concept formation is essentially creating stimulus classes, like antecedent classes, feature classes, and sometimes arbitrary classes. If I create a concept of a vehicle, right, and we have a car, we have a boat, right, and we have an airplane, okay, this is a concept. These three things make up a stimulus class. And how have they developed into that stimulus class? Well, we've had to generalize the response of vehicle across these three, while also discriminating between other stimuli. So antecedent class, right, because the antecedent of touch vehicle evokes touching a vehicle. Now, these are probably, a lot of times, a, a car, a boat, and a plane are probably arbitrary because they don't have a lot in common, yet they still evoke the same response. These are concepts. So when we talk about concepts, what we're really talking about is stimulus control, and that goes for anything, right? Animals and dogs and vegetables and fruits and food, on and on and on, right? Forming these concepts is really 
our responses are under stimulus control of these different stimuli. We're, we're generalizing and we're discriminating. So finally, transferring stimulus control, and we'll talk more about this in G4. Like I said, stimulus control makes up a lot of different ideas. We're transferring control from response and stimulus prompts to naturally existing stimuli. So when we have SD, prompt, response, consequence, this prompt is a temp array, right? Temporary SD. We need to fade that out to where the behavior is only under control of the SD. But we'll talk more about that in G4. Excellent. As always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for our study materials. Again, stimulus control is a difficult concept to grasp. It's very technical. There's a lot of terminology associated with it. What we need to remember is the behavior occurs in the presence of the SD and not the S delta because the behavior is reinforced in the presence of this stimuli, stimuli or stimulus and not in the presence of the S delta. Stimulus discrimination, stimulus generalization, all have to do with stimulus control. And when we form concepts or stimuli classes, we're putting behavior under the control of stimulus. Okay. So again, come back to this. If it's too much at first, it's okay. This is going to be a more advanced concept because really you want to understand stim stimulus discrimination and stimulus generalization first. And like I said, we're going to talk about prompt fading as well. So you want to understand maybe those key concepts first, those foundational concepts, and then come back to stimulus control. But at the essence, the behavior occurs in the presence of the SD and not the S delta. Like, subscribe, let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.